The next thing I want to do is talk a bit about um, the history of AI. And obviously the history of AI is going to be necessary abbreviated and simplified here, but I just want to give you appreciation for how multifaceted the history is and how you know, rich and somewhat sometimes controversial it is. So a natural starting point to talk about the history of AI is Alan Turing's famous paper in 1950 called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. So in this paper, he asks the question, can machines think? And he proposes the imitation game as his solution, uh, more popularly known as the Turing test. So, and some of you probably know the Turing test is uh, said to be passed by a machine if it can fool a human judge into thinking that is it's actually a human being. So this paper is remarkable, not because it built a system or proposed new methods, but it framed the philosophical discussions of what is intelligence for years to come. And you just have to appreciate how difficult a notion intelligence is to pin down. So this was really the first actionable formal answer to the question, can machines think? And now whether you think that working on a Turing test is a good idea that will lead to progress, is questionable and controversial, but at least philosophically, it's quite thought provoking. So for us, one major takeaway of the Turing test, which was not really highlighted, is this objective specification. So note that the test itself is meant to be capturing what a system ought to be doing independent of how you get there. It doesn't say whether it should be using neural networks or logic-based methods or so on. Um, and this modularity is going to be really important to us in, the, uh, in this course. So at the end of the paper, Turing does speculate on what might work. So he talks about two possible approaches. You could take uh, a top-down approach and try to tackle abstract problems such as chess. This is the route taken by symbolic AI. You could also, quote unquote, um, provide the machine with the best sense organs and aka sensors and teach it like a child. And this is more of the approach taken by neural and you know, statistical AI. And both have been tried and we'll see um, how all three uh, types of AI, symbolic, neural, statistical, kind of meld together at the end. So to so start our first story, let's go to the summer of 1956. The place was Dartmouth College. John McCarthy, who actually founded the Stanford AI Lab and uh, organized a workshop. He gathered the brightest minds of the time in attendance with Marvin Minsky, Alan Newell, Herbert Simon, all of whom want to make seminal contributions in AI. And the participants set out a not so modest proposal. It was to, they claimed that every aspect of a learning or any other feature of intelligence can be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So they were really after the, the moon, uh, the, the, they were after generality. And this was post-war computers which is coming on the scene. It was a really exciting time and people were really ambitious. So during this time, there were a few systems that were built. Um, Arthur Samuel built a computer program that could play che uh, checkers at a reasonable amateur level and actually featured some uh, you know, machine learning. Um, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon uh, came up with a logic theorist that could prove theorems. Um, for one theorem, they actually found a proof that was better than the human written proof, and they tried to submit a paper on the result, but the paper got rejected because the reviewers said it was not a new theorem. Um, what the reviewers didn't realize that the third author was actually a computer program. Later, they worked to uh, generalize these ideas to the general problem solver, which uh, was aimed at solving any problem, provided it could be suitably encoded in logic. And again, this carries forward the ambitious uh, general intelligence uh, agenda. And this was a time of high optimism with the leaders of the field who are all really impressive thinkers predicting AI would be solved in a matter of years. Um, but we know that they didn't get solved in 10 years. And there were some tasks such as machine translations, which were very stubborn. So there's now a folklore story. I don't know how true it is, but it's amusing nonetheless. 
um, you take a sentence like the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Translate it into Russian, which was the favored language for translation in the 50s. And you translate it back and then you get the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. So uh, this was less than amusing to the government funding agencies um, who decided to write a report showing how really machine translation wasn't going anywhere and cut off funding. This led to the first AI winter. So what went wrong here? So there's two things. First is that most of the approaches involved casting problems as logical reasoning, which required a search over an exponentially large state space. And the hardware at the time was just simply too limited. And secondly, even if the research had infinite compute, they would still not be able to uh, solve AI because there's just too many concepts in the world, words, objects, and all this information has to somehow be put into the AI system. So these grand ambitions weren't realized, but nonetheless, there were some useful contributions, uh, many due to John McCarthy that came out of this era. First, Lisp was invented to, for AI, and arguably it's still the world's most uh, advanced programming language. Garbage collection is something that if you're programming only in Python, it allows you to not know what garbage collection is. And time sharing, the ability to use a single computer by multiple people was prescient at the time. So then fast forward to the 70s and 80s, knowledge was the key word. And AI researchers thought knowledge was the key to combat both the computation and information limitations of the previous era. And at that time, expert systems became very fashionable um, where a domain expert could encode knowledge in the form of rules, usually looking like this. And there was a noticeable shift as well. The solve it all optimism from the 50s and 60s was gone. And instead, researchers focused on very practical systems targeted at particular domains. For example, chemistry, medical diagnosis, and uh, business operations. And there were some good things. Knowledge did help curb both the information complexity and also restricted the space, state space so that it alleviated the computation burden. And this was the first time that AI had real applications on industry, but there were obviously problems. Deterministic rules couldn't handle the complexity and uncertainty in the real world. And moreover, these rules just became quickly too complex to create and maintain. So this is a quote from Terry Winograd, who some of you know was on the HCI faculty at Stanford. But before he was a HCI faculty, he worked at MIT as an AI researcher. And this is what he had to say in the mid 70s. He thought that it was a dead end. There was just too many complex interactions between all the components, no easy footholds. And you just couldn't hold the, the uh, have a mental model of what was going on in your head. And Moreover, there was a lot of overpromising and underdelivering. Field collapsed again, and it really seemed that history was repeating itself. So at this point, we're going to leave aside the story of symbolic AI, which dominated AI for multiple decades, and go back in time to 1943 to tell the story of neural AI. So 1943 is a year often attributed to the birth of artificial neural networks. So McCullough and Pitts devised a simple model that, and study mathematical properties of the simple model. Um, but they didn't do anything in the way of uh, learning uh, the models or parameters. In 1946, there was a first learning rule by Donald Hebb based on the mantra that cells that fire together wire together. It was nice and simple, but it didn't really work. 1958, Rosenblatt came up with a perceptron algorithm for learning single layer artificial neural networks, AKA linear classifiers, which actually turned out to work really well um, and was used even fairly recently. Um, 59, there was an analog for linear regression by Widrow and Hoff. Um, they came up with actually a multi-layer generalization called Madeline, um, which was actually used to eliminate echoes on phone lines at the time. And this was one of the first real world applications of uh, neural networks. And then 1969, this was a big year. So Marvin Minsky, Seymour Papert wrote a small book called Perceptrons, 
and they analyze perceptrons with very mathematical properties. And they had a little tr almost trivial result that showed that single layer uh, perceptron couldn't recognize the XOR uh, function. And even though that has said nothing about the capability of deep networks, somehow this book is largely credited with uh, shutting down neural networks research and the continued rise of symbolic AI. It's a really kind of interesting piece of history and I you know, encourage you to go uh, examine it. In the 80s, uh, neural networks started coming back again. Um, 1980 was the first convolutional neural network, um, which was trained in a kind of a ad hoc way, 1986. Um, Romahard Hinton Williams um, reinvented uh, and popularized backpropagation for multi-layer networks. And now training became a little bit more principled. 1989, Yannickon um, devised a convolution network, network that was able to recognize handwritten digits um, and was actually deployed for the US, USPS to recognize uh, zip codes. Um, and this was one of the kind of first major success stories of using neural networks. Um, but until the mid 2000s, neural networks research was still fairly niche, I would say, and they were very notorious, hard to train. In 2006, this kind of started changing. Jeff Hinton and his colleagues had a paper showing how you could use unsupervised layer-wise pre-training to mitigate some of these effects. And the term deep learning started getting used around this time as well. Um, but it was really 2012, I would say, that was a real kind of the major break for neural networks. So Alice Trzkiewski, Ilya Suskover, and Jeff Hinton wrote this landmark paper um, which came up with what is now called AlexNet, a convolutional network, which had huge, huge gains in object recognition. Um, and at the time, computer vision community was very skeptical and it, almost overnight, it completely transformed the field. Think about computer vision without neural networks today. That's a kind of, um, it almost feels like kind of a distant memory almost. 2016 was another big event. AlphaGo um, defeated Lisa Do and Go, something that experts thought was still many decades away. And that just kind of firmly more established deep learning as a dominant uh, paradigm in AI. And this kind of continues even to the modern day. Um, but let's reflect so far. So we have seen two intellectual traditions, symbolic AI, which was roots in logic and neural AI with its roots in neuroscience. The two have fought fiercely over the decades over philosophical differences. But I want to suggest some food for thought. Maybe there are deeper connections here. So remember that McCullough and Pitt's paper that introduced neural networks and arguably the root of deep learning? Well, they spent most of the time talking about how it can actually encode logical operations. And the game of Go, which is actually a perfectly logical game de designed by a few elegant, simple rules. But AlphaGo used the power pattern matching capabilities of neural networks to solve this otherwise logical game. So there may be room for more uh, symbiosis than we think. So now there's a third and final story that we, we must tell to complete the picture. So this story is not really about AI per se, but it's about the influx of certain other ideas from other areas that have helped shape and form a mathematical foundation uh, for AI. And we call this statistical AI. So machine learning is very uh, popular, but the idea of fitting models from data goes, which is at the core of uh, machine learning, goes far back, even to uh, Gauss and Legendre in the, at the beginning of the uh, 19th century, who developed uh, least squares for linear regression. Classification was also very early in statistics. Um, and AI also consists of sequential decision-making problems for deterministic versions, Dijkstra's uh, algorithm from the algorithms community, for uh, models with uncertainty, from control theory, Bellman created Markov decision processes. Um, and notice that all of these developments largely predated um, the 50s which, and 40s where AI really kind of started springing up. So you might have noticed, if you're paying close attention, that where we left symbolic AI was at the end of the 80s, but where neural AI started really gaining traction was the 2010s. So what was going on in between? 
And what was going on between was that there was a period where the term AI wasn't really used, at least not to the extent that it is today. And I think that part of it was to distance, um, to add distance to the failed attempts of the recent uh, kind of AI winter. And also because the goals were just more down to earth. People talked about machine learning. And, then, and during that period, there were two paradigms. Um, there was uh, Bayesian networks developed in the 80s by Judea Pearl, which provided reasoning under uncertainty framework, um, which is something that a symbolic AI didn't have a satisfying answer for. 1995, support vector machines were developed, um, derived from ideas from learning theory and optimization. And at that time, SVMs were easier to turn tune than neural networks and really became the favorite tool in machine learning before deep learning started taking off again. So to kind of wrap up, you know, the, there's three stories that we talked about. Symbolic AI took a top-down approach and really failed to deliver on its original promise, but it did offer a vision and built impressive artifacts like question answering and dialogue system. Imagine trying to do this on ancient hardware in the 60s. Neural AI took a completely different approach, proceeding bottom up, starting with simple perceptual tasks which the symbolic community wasn't interested in at the time. I compared machine translation with removing echoes on phone lines, for example. But in the end, it offered a class of models and a way of thinking about data that has proven capable of conquering today's ambitious problems. And finally, statistical AI foremost for us will offer mathematical rigor and clarity. For example, in a course when we define, define objective functions as separate from optimization or have a language to talk about the complexity of a model and learning, these ideas and language all stem from statistical AI. And the course will actually be presented mostly through the lens of statistical AI. But I want to highlight that all three views are kind of compatible and just offer different advantages on the same underlying uh, ideas. Stepping back, you know, the modern world of AI is kind of like New York City. It's a melting pot that has drawn largely from a lot of different fields, statistics, algorithms, neuroscience, economics, and it's really a symbiosis between all these fields and how they come together and allow you to tackle real world applications that makes uh, AI so you know, rewarding. Okay, so that ends the, uh, the AI history module. Um, you can read much more about it uh, at a few links at the end of these slides.